A Tale of Wild Geese by Rosalie Fox The Wild Geese There were two hand-reared Canadian geese, the male big and proud with a long black neck, the female slightly smaller, with a slimmer, shorter neck and a pointed tail. Once there had been a man who trimmed their wings and fed them from his hand. The man did not come much any more, and their wings had grown out. They were free to go as they wished. Habit was strong, however, and they stayed close to their pond, mostly unbothered by humans. One day there were people beside their water, and they were disturbed. A girl and man walked there in the dawn. They talked, and the sound disturbed them. Then the people went away, and the geese were peaceful. Things flew over that were neither bird nor cloud, things that roared dully. They chased each other through the sky and shattered in mid-flight. The geese saw, and they kept from the sky when it happened. The people returned frequently. They were always together. Once there was a storm. Lightning struck a tree. It was dark and very close to them. The female, frightened, took to the sky. She was caught by a gust of wind. Hail and sleet pounded her. The wind hurled her into the fence. She was stunned and stuck, fought till she could fight no more. The people came with the morning light, and there were calm hands. The hands did things to her. They were strong. She could not fight them. The trust she had known when she was small was not altogether gone, and there was something gentle in the hands. Then there was enclosure, hands that fed her, smaller, less sure, but kind. She knew they meant no harm, but they held her, away from the male. He flew over every dawn, crying to her, Come, come away. Her instinct, the bond between them, urged her, but she could not get out. Then the big hands came again and set her free. They were together again, she and he. She tried once or twice to follow the male into the sky, but her wing would not carry her, and she did not try again. The people walked by the edge of the water, but the geese learned that they were no threat and were mostly unbothered. Then, for a long time, they didn't see anyone. The people were somehow connected with the strange happenings in the sky. They felt safer when the people kept away. Yet there was something compelling the female to trust them, something that stirred her about them. Then a flock of other geese came over, and the male rose on his dark, strong wings. There were shots. Some geese fell. The others swerved, flew away. The goose cried. She called him, come back. He did not come. She waited. She waited and called. Then the male returned. He was tired, but had come back, and she was content. The girl visited again, a man with her. He was not the one with gentle hands that had walked beside her, but they left together. The girl was different. The air trembled. For a long time then the geese had peace. There were still strange things passing over, but few things disturbed their pond and grazing fields. One day people came again. First the small one, then a bigger one. The male was restless. He rose on wings toward the sun, and the female, trying again at last, feeling the stirring of something within her, rose with, found her wings strong. They flew, circling each other, strong, mighty flyers. The next day a flock of geese came over and they left with them, the male flying slightly in front of her, opening a path for her in the sky the turmoil his wings made, carrying her too. The night they rested beside a river, and she was content. He was beside her. She could follow him now. They flew on. The next year they returned to their pond. The people were gone. They never came again. The geese raised a brood of six. When the season changed and the stirrings began again to go, they flew again, followed the flock. High. Free. Independent. Perhaps, just sometimes, when the goose calls her sad cry, remembrance comes to her, and she recalls faintly the two people who walked beside the water. Maybe she wonders, at the hands that healed her, whither they went, those two who walked together. Part 1. Chapter 1. A Flight of Fancy. Eleanor sits curled up on the couch, feet tucked underneath her. 
The fingers of her left hand idly stroking the curve of her stomach, her right hand holding the book that she's not reading. The record on the player softly hisses, hops to the next song with a crackle. Her hair is sweaty in the summer heat, lying clammy against her forehead. It's a humid heat, too. There's rain coming in the afternoon. She loves the heat. She loves the rain, too, the wild thunderstorms this country brings, very far removed from the cool, misty weather of the rainy country her thoughts had drifted to. In about an hour, it'll be lunchtime, and the menfolk and Tamara will come in with their noise and stir her and the whole house into activity. But for now, it's her and the music and the house at rest. She sighs, stretches her legs out from under her, wiggling her bare toes in front of her. Be careful, the doctor had said, smiling. You're very healthy, missus, but you're forty years old. Rest as much as you can, eat well, and call me at any time you feel worried. And so, she has these times of self-indulgence and daydreams. Being pregnant at forty doesn't make her feel old. It makes her feel about twenty again, full of dreams and promise and the things you feel at twenty. Twenty was a time to fall in love. She had done so much more than fall in love. She had seen a world war and lived and loved and grieved and lost. And how she had loved. How young she had been, and how quickly she had had to grow up and learn that everything could change in the blink of an eye. May this child never see times like that. And Tamara, her first, her wild-haired girl. Tamara turns 18 in three months. May her children see different times softer times. For her, in a different country, twenty years ago, there had not been many soft times. Twenty years ago, the year had been 1940, and the town had been a little place long forgotten in the mists of time and the rains of England. It had been centered around the RAF base. Both the base and the small town were now ruins, abandoned in the post-war years when larger bases in peacetime had met its demise. Thunder rumbles in the distance and lends atmosphere to her reverie. It had rained that day. Of course it had. The day had a chill to it, and the lark was quiet. It was early hours, and she knew it would pick up later. Duncan O'Connor was still sitting in the kitchen behind the bar, smoking his pipe and reading the newspaper. He would come to the front later, when the bustle started. She liked his comforting presence then. He was a hefty, middle-aged Irish man with a bad hip, friendly but stern and he ran a very tight ship. His bar girls were decent lasses, and treated with respect. It was not the sort of place where goings-on were tolerated. She was glad of that. She was young, inexperienced, and a bit shy. It was good to have Duncan at her back if things got too rowdy. Home was currently with her married sister Janice, after their father had accepted a commission to India and their mother had left shortly after to join him. Father was a military surgeon, and mother, ever a devoted wife. She missed her parents, but of course it was a whole experience to be a mostly independent wage earner, and in the early days of 1940, life was exciting and the threat was still vague. She had been working at the bar a month now and had started to settle into the rhythm of things. During rush hours, Duncan bartended and she waitressed, but when it was quiet, she handled most of the bartending as well and let him do his reading and smoking. She was wiping down tables, making sure everything was ready for the late afternoon and evening rush. She was keeping an eye on the door, expecting Johnny. She knew he would have been flying sorties today, scouting the coastline and keeping an eye out for enemy aircraft. She was looking forward to his company and a break in the monotony of the day. At some point, she thought she heard the drone of aircraft in the distance, but it could have been thunder. One of the village regulars came in, and she sent him through to Duncan at the back, where they would play checkers while it was quiet. The rain started coming down harder, and this time it was definitely thunder. It was then that Johnny Riley ducked through the droplets in the doorway. The short Irishman shook the rain from his black hair like a dog, his blue eyes narrowing in merriment. Ellie, my sweetheart, doesn't it just make the sunshine to see you? Would you light up my life with a double whiskey then, please, cuz? The endearments rolled off his tongue easily as the smile came to his face. Johnny brought a room to life. Short, compact, with a slight curl to his hair, the hint of a dimple in his cheek, black brows accenting his blue-eyed expression, and a sardonic twist to his mouth. Duncan had branded him as trouble and kept a glowering eye on him. Johnny seemed not to notice. 
and was always remarkably happy to see Duncan when he made his appearance. Keep an eye on that lad. He's up to no good. Don't be letting him charm you. I know his type from a very long way off. She laughed. I grew up with him, Duncan. His mother was my step-aunt. We spent almost every holiday together getting up to no good. There's nothing you can tell me about Johnny I don't already know. He does have a heart of gold. And a tongue of silver, because he could, and would, charm the absolute pants off most people. She adored Johnny. He was her friend and ally and brother, and she never quite figured out exactly how he managed to get a listing at the airfield in the town she moved to within a week after she arrived there. He had sent a telegram that he would see her shortly, and so he did. Bags and flying jacket and a thick layer of brogue-covered swagger. He dropped in most afternoons and would sit for long hours talking to her when things were quiet and the weather didn't allow flying. He was a Spitfire pilot now, and he wore the glamour of it cheerfully and ostentatiously. He had the lilt of the Irish in his voice, and his stories drew her pictures of the way clouds looked from above, the smell of a Spitfire's cockpit, and the thrill of contour chasing. He made her laugh, and he brought home closer. He also made a point of taking her home at closing time, dropping her off with a kiss on the cheek. Sundays he would often join them for lunch, and it was like the old days when they would lie in the orchard and daydream as cloud shapes passed over them. She poured Johnny a whiskey and wrote up his tab. Come sit with me, Ellie. He patted the bar stool next to him. She laughed. You know that's frowned upon. Let me make a cup of tea and sit on this side of the bar. Then it at least looks like I'm on the job. She brought the kettle to a boil and poured herself a cup. From the kitchen, the smell of the soup Duncan's wife was stirring up, and the soft bicker of voices over the checkerboard drifted through. What's the plan, cuz? Johnny asked out of the blue. What plan? For you. This war isn't going to be this peachy and mellow much longer. What's your ideas? What do you want to do? Where would you like to go? I'd honestly rather you were further away from the war than living in an airbase town. She shrugged. I don't know. I've been thinking of what I meant to do, what I want to do with my life. When war happened and Dad got sent to India and Mom went with... Sort of hanging now. I want to stay close to Jan. And you. Johnny deepened his dimples at her. Love, I'm a wild goose. I blow where the wind does. I want better for you. She smiled serenely at him. I turn 20 in a few months, Johnny. I'll figure it out. There's not much point in wanting to travel the world and designing grand plans while the world is deciding exactly how and where to war. He shrugged, lighthearted again. Tis true, but I would still like you to have a plan if things got worse. He took a swig of whiskey, and she looked at him through lowered lashes over her tea. Dear Johnny, but it would be all right, and she had family close to her. He interrupted her thoughts, veering sharply off course as he was inclined to. Actually, I have a favor to ask, cuz, and I want you to run it past Jan. I'd like to bring a friend on Sunday. He's a Canadian, a good lad. He hasn't any folks, I think neither here nor in his country. And getting him to meet some people might just do him good. He's house-trained and well-mannered, Jan will like him. Why must I ask? You're the one who knows him. Oh, my sweet Ellie. Jan is on that phase of wedded bliss where she is desperately searching for a husband for her little sister, and any and all friends that are not in the state of courting or marrying. If you ask, she'll be too happy to oblige. If I ask, she will immediately lock up the wine and the silver from the brigands that I spend my time with. Eleanor took a sip of her tea. All right, I'll give you that. It is an accurate summary if there ever was one. But how am I to lay my honor on the line for this Canadian fellow knowing the company he keeps? Oh, he knows no better. And I did take the liberty of telling him to meet me here this afternoon so you can inspect him. He glanced down at his watch. To be punctual, exactly eleven minutes ago, which might mean the blighter has ducked out. I would have ducked out too if you'd told me to meet you somewhere to be inspected. I told him I'm meeting my cousin for a beer and he should come. I'm not your cousin, and that is not a beer. I am caught in a web of my own deceit, Johnny gestured dramatically, and yet I suspect I have spotted approach. Wet boots sounded on the steps, and a young flyer stepped into the door. He was wearing a flying jacket, and he was bareheaded despite the rain, dark brown hair wet, falling tangled over his forehead. He was tall and wide-shouldered, and he had to wipe the rain from his eyes before looking up. When he did... He caught her completely off guard. 
was the strangest thing. His eyes were a very deep brown, and he looked straight into her gray ones. She wondered if he had the wind knocked from him, too, because it seemed that way. There was something utterly familiar about his eyes, and yet she couldn't put a word to it. The world did an entire rotation in quite the wrong way, and only then did she draw breath again and shake herself from the spell. Johnny had raised eyebrows. Ellie, this is Danny O'Neill. He's my mate from Canada. Danny, this is my cousin Eleanor Davies. She's from across two roads. We've been invited for lunch at theirs on Sunday. Glib little Irish bastard, she laughed inside. But Danny had stepped forward, reached out his hand, and she took it. Pleased to meet you, ma'am, and thank you. It'll be an honor. Oh, most definitely he was house-trained. And with that accent and soft-spoken ways, Janice would certainly just love him. She blinked slowly and smiled at him. How do you do, Danny? We're looking forward to having you, she said in her most elegant finishing school manners, and then knocked her teacup over. So Johnny achieved what he set out to do, and she suggested to Janice that she would like to invite a friend of Johnny's to Sunday lunch because he seemed a decent fellow and Johnny had asked because he was quite out of his depth in a strange country. She wondered about Johnny's motive and Johnny's friend. Johnny was forever bringing her things, shells, flowers, and once when they were younger, a kitten he had found in a hedge. This felt rather the same. Janice had a roast chicken going and Eleanor set about a hot potato salad. It was a cheerful family affair, these Sunday lunches. Tim was home and he liked making dessert. She loved Janice's big blonde husband. He always had a joke up his sleeve, treated her like a real sister he actually liked having in the house and made sure that her and Jan's wine glasses didn't get empty. There was laughter and bustle all around. They ended up waiting more than an hour for Johnny and his friend. Janice started getting agitated, but Tim put another record on the gramophone, grabbed her by the hand, and whirled her around him so her loose red hair flew, and she inevitably laughed. Relax, my love. No doubt duty called, and they'll be back soon. In fact, I'm pretty sure I heard a flight go up when I was out in the garden earlier. He was right and half an hour later they heard Johnny's beat-up car in the lane in front of the house. Johnny opened the kitchen door. He was at home enough to let himself in, and stomped the mud off his boots. Jan, my love, sorry for making you wait. Someone thought they spotted U-boats off the coast, so we had to check it out. But it turns out to have been some old lady who got a fright when she saw the spots on her glasses. This is Danny O'Neill. He's from Canada and joined the RAF because he thought we might need a hand. And the Moose Wranglers don't have proper aircraft to fly over there. Isn't that right, Danny? This is my cousin Janice. You've met Eleanor at the bar, they're sisters, and you might or might not have run into Tim in the hangars. He's Jan's husband, and bloody good at keeping a Spitfire airworthy. Danny stepped through the door from behind Johnny's back and smiled, extending a hand to Janice. Pleased to meet you, ma'am, and thank you for your kind invitation. Tim, thank you for having me. We actually spoke the other day in the hangar. Eleanor, great to see you, and thank you. He solemnly had a handshake for each of them. Eleanor could immediately see Jan's delight at his well-mannered, soft-spoken way and the slow, emphasized accent. You're welcome, Danny. We're pleased to have you. O'Neill sounds Irish. Do you have family here? Not any living that I know of, ma'am. My great-grandfather on my father's side was some kind of Irish privateer who ended up settling in America. My grandfather, my mom's dad, was from Ireland originally, but he farmed in Canada, I still have an aunt there, and she sounds about as Irish as it gets. Please, just call me Janice. I'm barely older than you, and we're all friends here. Tim put his one hand on his wife's shoulder with a bottle of whiskey in the other. I know Johnny's going to join me, Danny. Would you like to have one? That would be very kind, thank you. Just a single, please. He had to speak hurriedly as Tim started pouring very generously. Janice laughed. Keep an eye on him, Danny. Him and Johnny pour like sailors. Shall we move through to the dining room? The food's been getting cold for an hour now. They sat down and Tim said grace, afterwards filling up Jan's and Eleanor's glasses. The sky darkened outside with promise of rain. Janice got up to light candles. Why don't we just turn on the lights? Johnny grinned at her through his half-cold potato salad. Ambience, John. Jan looked down her nose at him. That's just an upper-class word for I can't see me food. Word to the wise from a married man. If you let them light the candles, they're less inclined to comment on how you pour the whiskey. It's the ambience, I think. Eleanor caught Danny's eyes across the table. 
He gave her a little nod, and his smile widened for a moment before he looked away. Jan's candles did do something, as rain started falling outside. It drew the whole room together and lent a softness to everything. There was intimacy and warmth in the room. The war was far away. They had Tim's bread and butter pudding for dessert and moved to the sitting room. Jan lit a fire and the easygoing closeness enveloped them. Where are you from in the United States, Danny? Tim asked casually. Danny's head jerked up. How did you know? I've met and worked with a bunch of Canadians in my life. I know a Canadian when I hear one. You're not it. Danny laughed. <laughs> I'm from Rome, actually. Rome in Georgia. I was born there and spent my whole life in the area till I got it in my head to come here. I would really appreciate it if you kept it between us. I could still get in a fair amount of trouble. Our lips are sealed. We appreciate the help and the risk you boys take with the neutrality clauses over there. From what I've heard, it's one hell of an issue if you get caught. I've heard ten years in prison being mentioned. It is a pretty big deal, yeah. Believe me, I was afraid of getting caught the whole time. This time it was Janice who chimed in. Well, what brought you here? I wanted to fly. I wanted to make a difference and I desperately wanted a chance to make something out of myself. I learned to fly when I was 17 and it became the main thing I wanted to do. Dean, my coach, mentor, flew in France in the Great War and honestly I think if he was still young enough and his wife would let him, he would have been here before me. Anyway, it seemed my life is kind of stuck in a rut and... Dean encouraged me to come join the Air Force. I went to meet my aunt over the border. She helped me work out a plan. I came over to Ireland on a fake business mission for their timber mill, and then enlisted as a Canadian. And your parents? What do they think of it? Jan was curious. She never minded asking people about themselves. They both died just after I turned 16. I had to drop out of school, and Dean helped me get a job. They were building a flying club on a piece of country just outside the city, and at first I helped with loose jobs on the farm with the construction. Soon the airplanes had my attention harder than anything else. Dean had a sop with camel he rebuilt and he showed me the ropes. Later on he helped me touch up on my school subjects and actually go to night school and write my exams, got a pilot's license. I taught flying for a bit, and then we talked about the RAF thing and I came here enlisted and started training and so on and arrived here just before Christmas. Is it very different here? It's very cold here. We have almost Mediterranean weather in Georgia, tropical storms and hurricanes and the winters aren't that cold. It took me a while to get used to the temperatures here. It must have been difficult to spend your first Christmas in a new country on an airbase in wartime. He smiled at her again, the same quick warm smile with a little kink in the corner of his mouth. It wasn't bad. I've really been kind of on my own for six years now. We did have quite good food, and the lads had a good time. Festive, even. He glanced at Johnny, and the smile got wider. Johnny is the kind of person who just lights up a gathering. Janice scoffed and looked at Johnny with the doubt of long familiarity. Johnny leaned back, laughed, stuck his feet on her coffee table. What he means is that I put flares down the chimney. You're going to be court-martialed the way you go on, and do you have to put your feet on my furniture? Sorry, mother, Johnny mocked, but removed his feet in a hurry. Don't you mother me, or you'll get your ears boxed. Eleanor, shall we go do the dishes and leave the men to their whiskey? But as she got up, the young American hastily leapt to his feet. Why don't I do that? It's the least I can do. You've been a wonderful hostess and chef, and would love to at least help clean up. Janice looked doubtful, and Johnny quite amused beyond containment. You're a guest, Danny. Relax. Eleanor and I don't mind. Sit down, Jan. Let the youngsters handle it and drink your wine. Eleanor, you've got help, and commandeer Johnny if you need more. Janice sat back down uncertainly. Thank you then, Danny, but it's really not necessary. If I do my share, then I have a chance to get invited back for more of your amazing cooking. Mess hall food gets boring after a while, and I'll gladly wash up. I'm sure we'll handle it, Jan. If he can fly a plane, he should be able to do dishes. I'll call if he's incompetent. They started cleaning up dishes in silence. Her mind was quite blank on all possible ideas of conversation. Finally, he spoke quietly as she was rinsing out the first dishes. I think it would be better if I washed and you dried off and put away, since I have no idea where anything goes. Oh, of course. Thank you. Did she have to sound so dumb? 
I actually wanted to have a word with you. Uh oh? She was startled. I am. got the impression that the invitation was Johnny's idea and it might have made you uncomfortable. He was incredibly earnest about it, too. He had the dishcloth wrung around one hand and was twisting it anxiously. Below that quiet charm, he was shy. She suddenly realized and smiled. I'm not inconvenienced, Danny, or uncomfortable. Please don't worry. He wasn't convinced, stood very quiet, measuring her expression against her words. You haven't really spoken, and you seem so put out when Johnny introduced us. She looked up, met his eyes. There was that same thing again. She took the dishcloth from him. I'll dry off with this one. You wash them. She stepped around. I wasn't put out. I was caught off guard. You see, I think Johnny is very cleverly trying to set us up, Danny. He froze mid-movement. I am so sorry. I had not... That had never even crossed my mind. Why are you sorry? She was smiling. He had incredibly long, thick eyelashes, and those eyes, they were striking. I am not, I suppose. I just don't want to distress you. I'm not in distress. Don't you mind, then? I don't think so. Do you? The long lashes lowered as he blinked down into the dishwater. He shook his head slowly, looked up at her very clearly, honestly. No, then I don't mind, and I would want to see you again, I think, if you wanted. You could walk me home tomorrow. It's my night off, so I'll get off at five. If you're right about it, Johnny will be smug. Johnny will be smug anyway, she laughed. Did he honestly put flares down the chimney? His reservation slipped a little bit, and she watched him as he told the story. His mouth made that little kink in the corner when he smiled. There was something earnest in him, something that drew you in. And there were those extraordinary eyes. She liked him. Chapter 2 Moth Wings she had seen the Spitfires climbing over town, their dark, moth-like shapes against a clear, cold spring sky, and thought of the young American. She had heard the engines in the distance when they returned, and wondered if he would come. Danny O'Neill pulled the flying helmet from his tousled dark hair, and blew a cloud of condensation into the air. It seemed he had been cold every moment since the boat had approached the Irish coast, the fog had hung thickly, and he fancied that there was no land, and they would just disappear into deeper and deeper mist and cold. But later the sun had come out, and there had been land after all. He had slept badly the first while, dreaming of the sweaty tropical heat in the summer sky of Georgia around him only to wake up for early morning drills to the English weather the coldest winter that England could recall. It had been strange sharing his space with so many people, but his ability to reserve himself and disconnect from his surroundings eased it and he grew used to the bustle. It was the flying that stayed the same, the deep joy in leaving the ground behind, far below. He hadn't met any of his compatriots, though he'd heard rumors of Americans in both Bomber and Fighter Command. He didn't know if anyone had figured out his nationality except Johnny and the Kirk household. The less people knew, the better. Either way, it wasn't something that he thought about a lot. He was entirely absorbed in his flying, and the incredible handling capability of the little supermarine spitfire that was his new love. He climbed out on the wing, stretching his legs. Off to his left, Johnny jumped off the wing of his Kmart spitfire with a whoop. Mad Irishman that, and the reason Danny had something on his mind other than flying in the cold. It was confusing. He hadn't planned on any kind of involvements. He hadn't met many girls, hadn't thought about it all that much. It was easy if you didn't have family, work to stay alive in a town where everyone thought they knew your business better than you did yourself. And yet, here he was, on his way to clean up and go meet a girl, with nervous anticipation knotted in his stomach. It's a war, Danny. It makes no sense to start liking someone now. There might be no aerial combat yet over Britain, a sham war. But all over Europe it was getting more and more real by the day, and would inevitably be upon them soon. It was bad timing, and a bad idea overall anyway. But he clambered gratefully out of his flight gear, washed and dressed, and made his way to the lark. She was sweeping the floor, dressed in a dark check skirt and a white, wide sleeve blouse. Her curly, dark brown hair bobby pinned behind her ears so her face was framed by it, and the curls fell loosely on her shoulders. His heart gave that same little jolt it had when he had first seen her. Hello, Eleanor. 
We were in a sortie earlier, and I'm free for the afternoon, so I thought I'd come look in. How are you? Danny, I didn't hear you. I'm fine, thank you. How are you? He thought that the way she emphasized her words, the smile with which she spoke them, made it the most genuine thing anyone had ever asked him. I'm great. Her smile brought his out too. I wanted to take you up on that invitation to walk you home. She looked the tiniest bit embarrassed. It's still about two and a half hours till I get off. Annabeth has the evening shift. Would you like to wait around? I don't mind, if it's okay with you. As long as you drink something so Duncan can't complain about my friend's loitering. She smiled. What can I get for you? He had a beer, stronger and more bitter than what he had had before at home. So, Danny O'Neill, you're here ready to go to war because you love flying. That's about the gist of it, but not all of it. I wanted a chance to build up a start, maybe have an opportunity to build a career and put something away for a future. He closed his eyes for a second, then looked at her levelly. If I'm being very honest, I wanted to make a complete break from where I came from so badly that it seemed quite worth the possibility of being killed. She was waiting for him to continue, her grey eyes looking quietly back at him. And do you still think it's worth it? I don't know. I love it and hate it. I hate the cold and how freezing and constant the rain is. I love the Spitfire. She's the most exquisite plane I've ever flown. You become a part of her. No more pilot and machine, it's one beast. Sometimes you feel like a dragon in the clouds, a fierce predator. Sometimes, when you're alone and the sky is just light around you and the clouds a silver-gray cloth beneath you, you feel like a tiny moth flying into the sun. You feel things man have no words for and everything is eternal. It's then that you know that you don't want to die. March 1940 Dear Mama and Father, How are you? We are all very well. It's been quite cold, but we are all healthy. How is the weather treating you in India? Jan has been in one of her cleaning frenzies and driven us quite nuts. How are you settling in? It took me some time to learn the bartending gig, but Duncan is a saint and so patient and helpful. Johnny has been doing his older brother duties and is checking in on me regularly. I appreciate him. He's still as much of a loose cannon as always. RAF discipline hasn't dampened his spirits in the slightest. He introduced me to a friend of his, a Canadian boy who came here to join the Air Force. He's very sweet and quite shy, but he becomes quite poetic when he speaks about planes. He's been walking me home a few times now, and I think I like him. Now, don't make like Jan usually does and start with the wedding bells, though I have to say she's been very good about it. Maybe it's because he's an outlander and friends with our Johnny. She has invited him back for Sunday lunch, though, so she doesn't dislike him. Duty calls. I have evening shift at the bar. I will write you soon to tell you tales of my dear sister, the gloomy weather, and the Canadian pilot poet. All my love, Eleanor. Chapter 3. When Skies Are Grey Outside the borders of Britain, the war was going badly, even if the skies above them were disturbed only by friendly aircraft. Danny would be flying patrol, and when he was at leisure to do so, he would sit quietly at the bar, talking to Eleanor in the quiet times, walking her home afterwards. He told her little about his past life, but he had dreams for the future. Will you go back to America? I don't know. It would depend on a lot of things, like if I even could go back. It doesn't seem likely. I'd probably have to stay on this side or go to Canada when the war is over. I still have some folks there. Either way, I'd like to save up and buy some land and run livestock. Some cows, a few horses maybe, and buy a plane, build a small hangar, start a flying school in a club where pilots can get together and hold a barnstorm every now and then. Something like what we had back at Rome at Dr. Gerard's. It could be a good life, nothing rich but happy, I think. His eyes were very dark in the dim moonlight. He looked up into the cold, early spring night sky, as if it held some hint into the future. His arm brushed against hers. What would you like to do? She laughed a little. <laughs> Is it bad that I don't know? I feel like I'm hanging around, waiting for some greater purpose. A grand design for my life. My whole family have always known what their purpose was and where they wanted to fit in in the scheme of things. Father is an army surgeon. Mother and he met when she was a nurse. They have this 
great love affair and sense of duty and service that drives them. Sometimes I think they even had Jan in me because it was a duty and a necessary sacrifice to have children. I feel like Mother resented our childhood because it kept her so much from following Dad to strange places. She took the pens from her hair and shook it out. Jan wanted to be a bus driver for the longest time. She laughed. Mother was scandalized. She insisted Jan trained for a secretary job. She did, then got an Air Force desk job. I think Dad pulled some strings through a high-up Air Force friend. That's also where she met Tim. Then when the war started, she became a WAAF, so she kind of achieved her dream. Every now and then she gets to drive RAF transports, which is pretty close to bus driving. I took a temporary job with Duncan at the Lark while I find my feet, and here I am still looking for them. Father suggested teaching, but I feel like if you're going to work with children, you should feel the calling. The world doesn't need more mediocre teachers. You see, I'm, I'm one of those people who can do a little bit of everything. I can paint, I play some piano, I can bake, I can almost sing. I've written short stories that I've done nothing with. There's no great talent or career in any of my little skills. I have a perfectly pleasant little Victorian wife prospect. I would like to be more, but I don't know what. I think you're more than the way you see yourself. You're the most serene person I've ever met. You have this sense of calm perspective to you, like you see every person in front of you clearly for who they are and accept them completely. It means something to people. You'll find your feet, and when you do, you'll astound yourself. They were coming to the end of the street and the end of their walk. She reached for his hand. I don't want to say goodbye yet. It was the first time she touched him. There was something there, like a current running between them. His hand was warm and he squeezed hers tight for a moment. Me neither. I feel like we're somehow running out of time. I don't really think about meeting someone. I wanted to make something out of myself before even considering it. Now the war is on our doorstep. And the way things are going, I think we'll be up against the full force of the Luftwaffe very soon. My days consist of flying patrol and looking forward to seeing you. There's this joy in me when I get to see you. I think we've got something here. And I don't know what real war is going to mean for us. It's all so wrong and feels so right. He had stopped. Let her hand go. He was very close. She could hear his breath and the little catch in it. Her own heart was beating wildly in her chest. Danny, I'd have liked to get to know you in less complicated times, but we don't get to set the timeline, and this is what we got dealt, so we have to make do with it. I'm glad Johnny made you come meet me, because my heart does this silly little skip every time you appear in the door. I think we have something important right here at our fingertips, and I'd like to try and hold on to it regardless of war. I'd like to give it a chance. He reached out, ran his fingertips very softly over the side of her cheek, brushed her hair back softly. She looked up at him. His eyes were very dark and it was hard to see what he felt, but she thought there was a hint of sadness. Then she closed her eyes as he very carefully kissed her. It was soft and clumsy. She thought that it might be the first time either of them had kissed someone. People were right. There were butterflies, and your knees did go quite shaky. How surprising. His breathing was uneven, and as she leaned her head against his chest for a moment, his heart thundered even wilder than hers. He was holding her carefully, the fingers of his one hand softly playing with her hair. They stayed like that a long moment, neither wanting to move. But clouds drifted in front of the moon, and the dim night became darker. No street lights were switched on for fear of bombing raids, and it was late and dark and cold. I must get you home and get back in. He walked her to the door. She looked up and smiled. There was that soft, sweet, tentative kiss again that melted her entirely. And then she watched his dark shape disappear into the gloomy night. She had the strangest feeling upon her. Joy mixed with something like grief. Chapter 4 Wings of Dawn In middle March, they started night fighter training. It was both terrifying and thrilling. The third night they did night flying, Danny could not sleep again after, the adrenaline running high. When the first light came, he slipped off base and went for a walk. He didn't know if she'd be awake, but he couldn't help himself. 
He found himself at the garden gate. Everything was quiet. He knew Tim and Janice got in later than he did, because Jan had been on tea duty when they had landed, and Tim had been working on Johnny Spitfire's landing gear, which had been troublesome the night before. He hesitated. It was logical that the room on the side of the house with the pink and lace curtains would be Eleanor's, but it was still risky. He took a deep breath and softly rapped against the window. Eleanor? There was stirring inside. He tried again. Eleanor, are you awake? He heard stirring inside. Johnny, is that you? She sounded sleepy, and the curtains moved and she peered out. Danny! I thought you were Johnny up to something. I didn't expect you. She didn't sound mad, though. I couldn't sleep, so I went for a walk, and I got the mad idea to come ask if you wanted to join me. She blinked at him for a moment, surprised, then smiled. All right, give me a second to get dressed properly, and I'll be right out. He didn't have to wait long. She came out in slacks and a beige jersey, her curly hair pinned up, smiling. Where to, good sir? He laughed. I was worried you might be mad at me and set the dogs on me. Didn't really plan any further than that. Duncan's got a plot of land just this way out of town. There's a pond and a stream. It's very pretty. We've picnicked there a couple of times last summer. He wouldn't mind if we went for a walk there as long as we keep the gate closed. Lead the way. Sounds like a plan. It was a pearly gray spring sky above, still and cold and lighting up the edges. The trees were starting to push little green leaf buds up into the light. Danny brushed her arm with his fingers. She easily slipped her hand into his. They came out of the small village and he saw the land stretched out before him. He'd only seen it from above before, never been a part of it. It was different to be walking it with the girl's hand in his. They came up to a big swaying wooden gate next to the road. This is it. They swung it open and creaked it closed again. There was a two-track road cutting through the dew-wet grass winding downhill. Below them lay a meadow with shorthorn cows and a piebald cob grazing scattered through it. Near the middle of the pasture, a stream and pond cut, splitting it in two. Some of the cows were belly deep in the water, greedily after the fresh reed shoots. They followed the track down to the water. Two Canadian geese were warily circling in the water, honking their mistrust at the disturbance. I didn't know there were Canadian geese in England. They're actually quite common here. I think some of them were originally brought here by the royal family in the 1700s, and they did a fair job of populating the country. It's the first time I've seen them here, and it's like a touch of home. We had them everywhere. We haven't had to chase them off the runways. You don't want to hit one of them taking off or landing. A lot of people can't stand them, but I just love the sound of those big wings and their big formations they fly in. It's a sight against the morning sky. It makes your heart lift. She smiled up at him and her eyes were the same pearl gray as the dawn light. You're kindred spirits, Danny. Creatures of the sky. They're beautiful birds and I love their calls. There's something pure and sad to it, like a lament for something long gone. He couldn't resist. He had to kiss her then because there was something beautiful and wistful about her too, and she understood it. The geese took off from the water in a massive spray and beat their way powerfully into the sky as the sun came up. Chapter 5. Clouded Horizons As March neared its end, patrol missions increased. Johnny became a less frequent visitor to the Lark. It seemed he had a blown interest in the neighboring village. For a while, he had seemed to have something going with Annabeth, but Eleanor was never sure. She missed him, but she was also day-to-day -day more engrossed in the young American sergeant pilot. Janice asked, and because there was no reason to hide it, she told her. I think we're slowly falling into something serious here, Jan. I like him, and I think I like him the way you did Tim. You knew from the start with Tim, didn't you? I did. I think I did, though we are much wilder than you two. I think we drove mother and father wild with worry. I think they would like your quiet American, in the well-behaved, old-fashioned way you seem to be courting each other. Jan laughed. For a long time, all of us thought you and Johnny would end up together. He adores you. You practically raised each other, but neither of you moved past that brother-sister feeling, did you? I don't know. There were brief moments I wondered, but never really thought about it. Honestly, I think he set me and Danny up. It was pretty deliberate. He's a funny man, our Johnny. I wish he would find a nice girl, and I'm also kind of glad it's not you, Ellie. 
think much as you love him, he would wear your heart out. I don't think he'd ever settle down completely. Look at his father. He never did either. There's a big streak of him in Johnny. And yet they can't be in the same room without going for each other. It's a sad thing. I think everything Johnny does is to tick off his father. Enlisting in the RAF wasn't purely because he liked the idea of flying. It must have kicked off a terrible fight. He came to see me to tell me he enlisted. I was still in school and I remember he had a bruised cheekbone. He was positively pale and yet wildly triumphant. I wonder what would have become of Johnny if he didn't mostly grow up in our house. He would have been a pickpocketing street urchin growing up. Janice laughed. Sadly, I think you're not far off. But back to your American, what are your plans? We haven't really talked anything definite yet. He wants a plot of land somewhere to start a sort of flying club on and farm on small scale. I want something more than to carry drinks and white tables, but I don't know what yet. It's very confusing. I know. It's a bad time to try and figure out what you want in your life. I don't think anything will ever be the way it was before the war. Have you told Mom and Dad about Danny? I mentioned him. I'll keep them in the loop if we make decisions. Otherwise, Mom will be nipping at my heels for letting her youngest be seduced by airmen and not telling her. Eleanor felt her face getting warm. There's no seducing happening, Jan. Jan shrugged, laughed. Look at you blush. Not yet, then, anyway. Just keep them in the loop and make good decisions. You're awful, Jan. It's not like that. I'm just saying. I don't want to be the one that tells them nothing if you elope and run off to America with their grandchild. You read too many bad romance novels. You're sensible, and I trust you, Eleanor. He's a good boy, I think, and he's bringing out a shine in you that I haven't seen before. It's good to have someone who makes you shine. It was an unaccustomed moment of sweetness from her older sister. Thanks, Jan. I do think it's going to get serious, and if he wants to go somewhere else after the war, I suppose we'd go. We just can't tell them in a letter that he's really American. Best to stick with the Canada story. It was strange to say the thoughts that she played in her head at night out loud. She imagined a little cottage on a ranch and him flying a bright yellow plane in at sunset and coming home for dinner. It was very unreal and a very movie-like idyllic picture and she knew nothing was quite like that in real life but it was a sweet picture and something to hold in her heart. She did right too because Jan was right. Dear mother and father, how are you? We're all well, and the weather is getting much better. It's feeling like summer now. The war is getting closer. Poor Tim is working ridiculous hours, and Jan is often out nights on duty. I'm getting to be a good carrier of drinks and wiper of tables. Duncan gave me a small raise. I think I might head to London on my day off and buy some summer clothes soon. I seem to have nothing wearable that isn't something a schoolgirl would wear on a holiday. I might ask Johnny to go with me and catch up a little. I've barely seen him lately, but I gather he has a girlfriend in a different town. So, Janice has been after me to keep you up to date on Danny, my sergeant pilot. She seems to think we're about to elope or something. I do like him, though, and I think you would, too. But there are no plans to elope. He's a bit like what the movies reckon a southern gentleman would be like. He walks me home when not on duty. We've taken to walks in the country. I feel like we're making steady progress. And at the current rate, he might ask me to marry him in about seven years. So as you can hear, we're really moving fast. Don't let Jan worry you if she writes. I'll write again next week. Have you seen any tigers yet in India? You must send me some photographs of what it looks like there. And I'd like one of you too. I miss you. All my love, Eleanor. She asked Johnny to go with her to London, and he very graciously accepted, and then criticized her fashion sense the whole time. They laughed most of the way in his scrappy little convertible, and it felt just like the old days when they ran the town flat on bare feet. They ended the day at a streetside cafe and drank cocktails. So, how's love and life, Johnny? I hear you're having a marvelous affair with a buxom blonde. He scoffed and laughed. Oh, am I the talk of the town, then? Sweetheart, you wouldn't believe it. I met Patricia at a dance there, and we really hit it off. Spent two weeks driving back and forth. Thought I'd met my future wife, and then turns out she's got a husband on a ship in Portsmouth. It's a big guy, too. 
I'm not getting my face rearranged for a married woman. Oh no, Johnny, I'm so sorry. You don't look very heartbroken, though. Are you sure you were thinking she's your future wife? See, you know me all too well, Ellie. Ah, my heart is just fine. I'm curious on yours, though. It seems as though you and my American wingman are really getting along. It seems so, doesn't it? Johnny smiled, his blue eyes teasing. He's a good lad, Ellie. You're the same kind of folk. There's just one thing. You'll have to hear his story and decide if it's A-OK -okay with you. I know you, like I raised you, and I sort of did. I think I know how you'll take to it. But you have to hear it yourself, and if you decide to stick with him after hearing it, you'll have to show him. Where he comes from is a big deal to him, and the only thing keeping him back. He told me the story one night when we had a couple too many beers. It's not my story to tell, but it shook me, and I think you have it in you to hear it and like him the more for it instead of run away. She was silent for a long moment, staring earnestly at Johnny, shocked a little. Is that story the reason behind those sudden quiet moments? The change in his eyes whenever something about his past comes up? I don't look that deeply into his eyes, uh, but you'll see he doesn't quite mingle with the lads. He's just the tiniest bit out of place. I don't think he mixed with people much since he was a boy. Take your time, and don't hint to him that you know there's something. But you'll have to get him to tell you if you really like him. Is it something really bad? It shook me, as I said. But it's more about how his life has been, not how he's been. I think you'll like him more, not less, but he might not see it that way. He was even jumpy around me after he let it slip. If he tells you, and you need to, come talk to me about it. We've been flying and living together for a few months now. You get to know someone pretty well in that kind of setup. I could probably tell you the things you'll want to ask after you've heard. And you know, Ellie, I do call him my friend. She was quiet on the way back, her head spinning. There was suddenly a dark cloud hanging over something that had seemed very simple and straightforward. Johnny spoke once before he said goodbye and dropped her off. Listen, El, I think I might have spoken out of turn, me running me big mouth off. I didn't warn you off. I meant you to try and get behind the thing that's going to get in your way if you don't get it out of him. I think of you as my sister, and I might feel a similar way about Danny. You're two really good people, and I think you're onto a good thing. He kissed her on the cheek. Go put on your lipstick and a pretty dress. I'm sure Danny will be dropping by as soon as he knows I've delivered you back safely. And don't tell your mom about Patricia or I'll get another scolding letter.